I have the joy this morning of introducing a guest speaker. For some of you, uh, he won't need introduction because you were at the seminar yesterday. Jim Donahue is a pastor at Covenant Fellowship Church. He has been for, I think, over 20 years now serving as a pastor in that church. Some of our members have been members at that church, so he has been a pastor to members of our church in the past and certainly a friend to many of us. Um, we've made the point multiple times on a Sunday, but I want to make it again this morning. What a, a gift it is, a protection and inspiration and a provision of the Lord to be a part of a family of churches. Uh, there is a, a security that we have as pastors in knowing that we have, have men that believe the same values uh, we believe about the gospel, about the doctrines of grace, about the local church, about the priority of evangelism, about church planting. The list can go on. Jim is one of those men. It's a joy to be a church knowing that there are men like Jim around the country and the world preaching from the scriptures Sunday after Sunday, proclaiming these same doctrines of grace, and not only just proclaiming them, but that have affection for our church in particular. We were just uh, with Jim yesterday, Aaron and I, and we were trying to communicate to him the benefit that our church has received from Covenant Fellowship. Just, just this year, uh, if you look back at the last calendar year alone, uh, we've received so much from this church. If you remember last year, uh, Jared Mellinger, who's the senior pastor of Covenant Fellowship Church, came in to do a seminar today. Uh, this year, just, uh, you know, yesterday, Jim served us by preaching on evangelism over a couple of hours uh, with a class from people in our church. We had gathering of leaders Friday night where he was able to encourage and exhort us in this topic as a church, agreed to preach this morning on this topic to encourage and exhort us. In just another month and a half, a friend of Jim's named Doug Hayes is going to come in and talk to us on the good news of the topic of adoption. Uh, he serves as uh, director of a mercy ministry in their church. We'll introduce him uh, in just a few weeks. Um, but we, we just were trying to tell him, Jim, you have to understand your church has served us so significantly. And perhaps most significantly, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, Joel Shore, you remember, came in and led the VBS that we put on for our community preached here on Sunday. Uh, and Joel is from Jim's church. So Covenant Fellowship Church has laid down their lives, uh, laid down their, their resources, given up people, pastors, sending them to serve us. And I, I just wanted to express to Jim how grateful we are for that. We are not an independent church. We're a dependent church. We're, we're proudly dependent on other churches. And this is one of the men we're dependent on in a particular way. Uh, of all the pastors in Sovereign Grace, Jim is certainly uh, at the top of a very short list, among a very short list of men who inspire every pastor in Sovereign Grace in the topic of local evangelism. Now, he's equipped to preach on any number of topics this morning, but there is a unique passion and anointing an example that he brings to every pastor in Sovereign Grace on this topic. If you were there yesterday, you experienced it firsthand. And because we've been accenting this topic in general this year, we went through Jim's course called Proclaim in the Spring in our small groups. We're going through Acts and highlighting evangelism as a church because of this priority and because we need fresh reminders in this topic. If you're like me, this, this topic drifts from our conviction. We're convicted and then it drifts away. And we wanted Jim to come to freshly inspire us and motivate us in reaching the lost. So for all of those reasons, I am grateful, Jim, that you've been willing to come and serve us. Thank you for giving up your weekend. We're grateful to have you. Let's welcome Jim as he comes to serve us this morning. Well, good morning. It is so great to be with you guys, and I, I couldn't agree with John more about uh, the partnership that we feel um, and the importance of it. It's not something that we just say that we're partners, but we, we truly are family. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of uh, meeting fa like family that you've never even met, like you're a family member 
uh, that we never met. And that's how I feel because God, the way God has joined us together uh, in our mission. And it's so great just to, to be here with, with some family members um, closer to um, and that uh, we're part of Covenant Fellowship, like the Folkers uh, who are here and Stan and Judy Boulay who are just an amazing couple. We were so sad to, to lose them to you guys. It was really, uh, you know, I was just reminded even today, um, when I was coming, and I was like, oh, I, you know what, I need to get a bottle of water, and uh, I usually have tissues, and I couldn't find any tissues, and, and I didn't bring any mints, and what, one of the things that Judy Belay always did for me was to take care of whatever needs I had, so when I came in, there was a bottle of water, tissues, and mints on the podium, which is what she did for me in our bridge course and on Sunday mornings. And so it's just to see that and her heart and stand uh, for serving, you know, so to see some family members I'm a little bit closer to, like the Boulets, but also uh, to be with you guys and to see how God has blessed you. Um, The Mayfields are dear, dear friends and family members. We had a chance, uh, my son Adam and I came, also brought another friend, Paul Carberry, uh, to stay with the Mayfields and to stay with all these boys, which was just a a great time for me. I have two boys, and so um, I was kind of used to, at one point, the kind of boy level that was in this home. Um, But this, they were showing me how to grapple. It was a lot of wrestling, a lot of time down on the rug and stuff, but... This family is just amazing. I can't even tell you how much I respect and love the Mayfields. Um, To watch Aaron lay down his life uh, for the gospel and for this church, uh, the way that this man serves. He's a tremendous leader, and you can see that just in his trip he took to Houston. Tremendous leadership gifts and insights and wisdom, and yet he does it in a way that's so humble. Uh, and the way he asks questions and he learns. And so he's a real example to me and Holly and the way they're raising uh, their boys. So I thank God uh, for this. These are family members to me, uh, especially because we share that Cowboys connection that we had when... When Aaron was in um, Pennsylvania, uh, Aaron and Holly, he would always come over and watch the Cowboys games with us. Believe it or not, we are Cowboys fans, and, and my son and I are going to the Dallas game tonight for his graduation present, so pray that the Cowboys win. All right, turn with me to John chapter 4, and this is the story of Jesus and the woman of Samaria, or the woman at the well. This is an amazing story. An amazing story where we're going to get to see the heart of Christ and we're going to get to see his, his love for those uh, who don't know him. So look at John chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he, Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water, and he's probably pointing to the well there, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. 
The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Several summers ago, I took a trip to a town in Pennsylvania called Altoona, Pennsylvania. Isn't that a weird name, Altoona? Probably no one here has heard of that, but I was there and um, I had one of these wonderful guy moments. You know these guy moments where you're either able to defeat someone or bust on someone in some way or correct someone for not knowing certain guy information? Well, I had one of those opportunities with one of our um, interns. We were had a real busy weekend doing a lot of things, evangelism seminars, meeting with people, taking people out to share the gospel. I, was, I preached on Sunday morning. I was absolutely exhausted, tired. I was super hungry. And as we drove into this restaurant, restaurant, um, there was this Ferrari. And the guy who was an intern said, whoa, look at that Lamborghini. And I was like, that's not a Lamborghini. It's a Ferrari 458 Italia. And so it was just like a body slam on that guy. You know what I mean? You can't, as a guy, that's just hard. And, and so I don't know a lot about cars, but, but I know a little bit about Ferraris. And I love these Ferraris. And so when I came, we, this guy was in the same restaurant. We were eating at Chipotle. And we came down, and, and I was just like the car. I forgot all about how hungry I was. And I'm just like over the car, like slobbering over the car, taking pictures of the car, taking pictures of myself with the car, and just like wandering around. They had all gone in to eat, and I'm just like circling his Car. There was another guy out there with me slobbering over the car as well. And so then I finally went back in to eat and got in line. And even though I was starving to death, then I saw the guy. I introduced myself. I was like, oh, he's going to go start this up. So then I went and I said, hey, could you rev the engine? He's like, hey, you know, guys who buy Ferraris live for these kind of moments. And so he's like, sure, yeah, you want to see it? So he's like, you know, you know, revving the engine. The other guy that was with me came outside because he wanted to hear the engine. You know, the little high pitch, that high pitch Ferrari sound that's so awesome. You're going to know what I'm talking about, right? So this guy is like, you know, revving this engine. We're like, oh man, this is incredible. Now, one of the, it, it was, it was seriously amazing. But, but I'll tell you what's the reason I'm sharing this story is because I can't remember any moment in my life where I've ever forgotten about eating. Okay. <laughs> it, I'm that serious about food. Like I would never, there's almost nothing that could make me forget about eating eating food. And, and, and that's the question I want to ask you. Have you ever been so excited about something, so passionate about something that you don't care about eating? In this story, Jesus is so passionate about reaching the lost that he doesn't care about eating. He forgets about his physical needs because those around him have even greater spiritual needs. Now, I want to ask the question, what did Jesus do to reach this woman? And there are eight things, yes, eight things that we're going to see. We can learn even more than eight things from this, but I've narrowed it down to just eight things we can learn. How did Jesus reach this woman? Number one, Jesus cares. Jesus cares. Look at verse 3 again. Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And it says in verse 4, look at this. And he had to pass through Samaria. He didn't have to pass through Samaria. In fact, most Jews would not go through Samaria. So Jesus was in the south in Judea, and so he had to go up to Galilee. Remember, Galilee's in the north up here. Most Jews would not go straight up through Samaria. They would go out and around Samaria because they hated Samaritans. 
They considered Samaritans half-breeds. They, they were despised. To, to just be with a, a Samaritan would, would defile you. They were unclean. So Jews would avoid them and travel around, go the long way around to get to Galilee, but not Jesus. It says here that he had to pass through Samaria. Why did he have to pass through Samaria? Why was it necessary? It's because Jesus cares about people who are far from God. Jesus cares about people who are hurting. He cares about the lost. He cares about the broken and those who are empty and hopeless. He cares about people who are going to hell. He cares so much he was willing to risk his reputation by talking to an immoral woman. He was willing to, to go tired and hungry and thirsty. Jesus was willing to sacrifice comfort and ease to rescue her. This woman was being deceived and destroyed by sin. She was in great danger. She had no way of rescuing herself. Jesus had to go through Samaria because he cares about the lost. So that's number one, Jesus cares. Number two, Jesus blows through barriers. I love this. Jesus blows through barriers. Look at verse 7. It says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, this is absolutely scandalous. It's scandalous. Not only does Jesus decide to go through Samaria, but now he sits down and talks to a Samaritan. Jews are not supposed to talk to Samaritans. And not only is she a Samaritan, she's a woman. Jewish men are not supposed to talk to women in public. And not only is she a woman, she is an immoral adulteress. And rabbis are not supposed to talk with immoral adulteresses. What Jesus is doing is, is absolutely unheard of. It's shocking. He is blowing through social barriers. He's blowing through racial barriers and moral barriers because he has to reach her with the gospel. Don't you love this about Jesus? Everyone else is avoiding and rejecting and judging this woman. Her life is so messed up and so steeped in sin that she doesn't want, even want to be seen. She doesn't come early in the morning to get, to get water with the other women. She comes at noon during the hottest part of the day. It would be like going to the grocery store in the middle of the night so that you don't run into someone. This woman was rejected by the whole world. But she wasn't rejected by Jesus. His love is unhindered by her reputation and her sin. She is not out of the range of grace. You know, when you're hunting, sometimes something, an animal, whatever, it gets, it's out of range. It's too far away. You can't, you can't get it. This woman is not out of range. She's not too far away. She hasn't sinned too much. She's not out of the range of grace. Don't you love when you're reading the Bible to see how much Jesus loves people? Don't you love to see Jesus give people grace? He is passionate about giving people grace and forgiving their sins. If Jesus doesn't take a risk here and cross these massive boundaries and offer her living water, who will? Who is going to save this immoral woman from hell? She was all alone. She came at noon in the hot sun to avoid the other women, to avoid the condemnation and shame. And that's really what sin does. It, sin drives us away from people. It isolates us. Imagine what it felt like for this woman. She's working on her sixth husband. And she probably knows this one won't work either. She probably feels trapped and hopeless and broken. And, and many people find themselves in the same place. Sin has isolated them and trapped them. And hope has disappeared. Jesus had to talk to her because she would have never talked to 
to him. He didn't assume that he should just kind of sit by the well until a spiritual seeker came along and asked him a question. No, he took the initiative. He asked her a question. Do you realize that most non-Christians will not voluntarily come to us? Most non-Christians won't take the initiative to start a spiritual conversation with us because they don't know that they need to have a spiritual conversation. We have to go to them. They're not going to take initiative to build friendships with us. We have to take initiative to build friendships with them. In verse 40, we learn that Jesus stayed with the Samaritans for two days. Now, what do you think the disciples thought when Jesus told them they were going to spend the next couple of days with the Samaritans? Well, I'll tell you, they probably thought things that they would later need forgiveness for. They hated these people. They had no desire to, to love them or, or reach out to them. They were unwilling to cross these kinds of boundaries. And you know, I think the same is true for us. It's, it's much easier for us to relate to people who are like us, people who aren't messy and needy. It's, it's easy to avoid situations that might feel awkward or, or uncomfortable, but Jesus doesn't do that. He smashes through these boundaries. No race barrier, no economic barrier, no moral bar barrier, no social barrier can stop him. His heart is so filled with love that nothing can keep him away. Number three, Jesus shows mercy. He shows mercy. Look at verse 10. I love this verse. I love what Jesus says here in verse 10. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, and he's talking there about salvation and forgiveness, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Non-Christians, listen, non-Christians don't know what they're missing. They don't know the gift of God. They don't know about the gift of God. They, they don't know that they can find forgiveness and satisfaction in Christ. A satisfaction that's so superior to what the world offers. It's like the superiority of the Grand Canyon compared to a hole in the ground. They don't know the gift and they don't know where they can get it. They don't know that Jesus is the one that can give them the gift. And so they look everywhere and never find it. Jesus is saying to this woman, if you knew what God could do for you, if you only knew what God could do for you, and if you knew who I was, you would ask me for something. I'm just asking you for a little drink of water, but I also have something to give to you that's far greater than this water. This is amazing. Despite this woman's rebellious, filthy lifestyle, her blatant rejection and disregard for God, Jesus wants to give her water. Do you see that? He wants to give her living water. This is, this is a stunning picture of the Savior. Jesus saying, just, just ask me for it. If you only knew that I could forgive you, if you knew who I was, you would just ask me, I want to give you this living word. I want to forgive you. I'm eager to give you grace. I'm so willing. I'm not rejecting you. I'm inviting you to come and get what I have. I want to share it with you. That's amazing. Jesus wants this immoral woman to have eternal life. He is infinitely willing to show mercy to sinners. It's a great quote by J.C. Ryle. He says, all day long, Christ stretches out his hands. He stretches out his hand to those who are disobedient and, and gainsaying. That's those who oppose him. He, Christ, has thoughts of pity and compassion towards the vilest of sinners, even when they have no thoughts of him. He stands waiting to bestow mercy and grace on the worst and most unworthy if they will only cry to him. 
the lost will discover at the last day that they had not because they asked not. What mercy Christ has for those who are lost. Now, I don't, I don't know what you think about Jesus. Maybe you don't see him as merciful and kind. Maybe you see him as an angry judge or at least someone that is hard to please. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you haven't trusted your life to Jesus, he is willing to take you right now. It does not matter how badly you have sinned or how much you have messed up. Just ask him. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to receive you. Ask him to give you eternal life. He wants to give you the gift. He wants to give you living water. So how does Jesus reach her? That's number three. Number four, Jesus connects relationally. He connects relationally. Relationships are critical when it comes to reaching people. Friendship is actually the most effective way of reaching people with the gospel. That's what Jesus did everywhere he went. He built friendships with people who were far from God, like Zacchaeus or Matthew with his tax collector friends, the woman caught in adultery, Mary Magdalene, blind Bartimaeus. Jesus was, as the Bible says, and this is my favorite name for Jesus, a friend of sinners. He was a friend of sinners, and we see him building a friendship with this woman by initiating a conversation, asking for help, asking her to help him, offering to help her, being honest about her sins and problems, and spending two more days with her village. Now, there's a lot we can learn from this, but let me just mention one thing. When Jesus said to this woman, give me a drink, that was an act of kindness, he was reaching out to her as a real person with his own real need. He was showing weakness. Others in the village just avoided and condemned her. Jesus believed that she was made in the image of God and had value, which is why he asked her for a drink. And we should be willing to ask people to help us. We should be willing to ask non-Christians to help us. It, it promotes friendships. We don't want to communicate to non-Christians that you need us, we don't need you. This is only a one-way street. No, we, we don't want to communicate that. And we shouldn't be afraid to be real and vulnerable with them. We don't need to pretend that we have it all together or that life is perfect. We should be real with people and let them see where we struggle and let them help us where they can. This is one of the ways that we connect relationally. Number five, Jesus says some uncomfortable things. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Can you say uncomfortable? I mean, hello. Can you imagine talking with a stranger, and all of a sudden they bring up your deepest, darkest secrets? Why did Jesus do this? And doesn't this kind of go against the idea of friendship? Like, isn't this like rule number one of being a friend? Like, don't bring up the most horrible thing they've ever done. Why is Jesus doing this? Well, he's not trying to needlessly offend her. He's trying to help her. He wants to give her living water. And the only way for that to happen is for her to see her sin. She's an immoral woman who has lived life for pleasure apart from God. And so Jesus says, go and call your husband. By saying this, he is putting his finger on the problem of her immorality. Her main problem is not that she has to draw water in the heat of the day. The main problem, her main problem is her sin. And so Jesus just goes right after. You've had five husbands and you're sleeping with number six. John Stott, I mean, I'm sorry, this is J.C. Ryle again. Um, J.C. Ryle said, till men and women are brought to feel their sinfulness and need. No real good is ever done for their souls. I want you to look at how serious that quote is, the severity of what I just said. Till men and women are brought to feel their sinfulness and need, no real good is ever done for their souls. In other words, you can't help someone spiritually 
You can't do any good for their souls unless you help somebody see their sin. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Jesus was willing to confront her sin to do good for her soul. And I love this about Jesus because he had a lot of courage. I do not have a lot of courage. I, I have a lot of fear. When, when I was in Altoona, I did this evangelism seminar, and we decided to go out. We were going out to share the gospel uh, right after lunch. And so one of the things I had mentioned, unfortunately, in the evangelism seminar is that uh, I've, I've had an opportunity to share the gospel with many people since I've been a Christian, and, and I, I try to do, go out and do that as much as I can. And, but one of the things I've really been afraid of, and I, I've never shared the gospel with up until that time, was a librarian. And I apologize to any librarians that are here. I just had this terrible fear of librarians. I mean, just a horror, like fearful. It's just, I don't know if it's the glasses that hang down here and the way they have their hair that's in a tight thing. And I'm just, I've just been petrified of them. Anytime I've thought about like sharing the gospel, I'm afraid they would tie me up in the back and throw rotten tomatoes at me and they're just gonna kill me. And so I've just been locked up. I'm just admitting this, it's just a confession, like locked up. I apologize to any librarians as I've shared this message before. I've had librarians come up to me and say, I'm a librarian, I've had to apologize to them, but this is just a weakness that I have. And so, so as we were going out, um, the pastor's son said, uh, asked his dad, say, hey dad, can I take Mr. Donahue over to the library? And his dad said, sure. And so this kid, he's like 14 years old, said, hey, Mr. Donahue, you want to go to the library and we could try to share the gospel over there? I'm like, uh, no, no, I really don't want to go over to the library. And so he's like, but I got this kid, he's got all kinds of things. He's like, come on, let's do it. And, and so I'm like, uh, okay. And so I'm scared to death. We're walking up to this library, right? And this is, it's a huge, like it, the whole thing, I'm not kidding, is made out of cement. It looks like a fortress, like a bunker of Satan. And so I, <laughs> I am just scared to death as we're coming up into this. And the kid was just great. He's like, oh my goodness. I'm like, this guy's got so much faith. I don't, and I was really, I was really scared, like genuinely. And so we come in there uh, into the fortress, I mean the library, and we get in. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna just try this. And so I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm kind of praying and walking around looking for somebody. And so I see this guy talking to the librarian. He seems very talkative. And so he, he kind of breaks off and I thought, okay, well maybe I'll try to talk to him first. And so I went up to this guy and I said, hey, excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? Well, it turns out this guy was absolutely crazy. I mean, really, he was mentally crazy. He goes, he goes you're not going to believe this. The Russian mafia is really strong in Altoona. You know what I mean? They got a lot of Russians around here, and they're following me right now. They got people, there are people tracking me. And, I'm, and he starts going on to this crazy stuff about the Russian mafia in Altoona. I, he, I couldn't even get a word. I, every time, I, could I just, if I could, it, I just want to try to, and it took me about 10 minutes to get out of that conversation. I was like, oh my goodness, this was a disaster. And so, I'm like, okay, okay, try to regather. And so, okay, there was a librarian, okay. I found the librarian and I thought, okay, he was a young guy. I thought, okay, I can do this. So I came up and I introduced myself to him with the church. I went through a little spiritual survey. I used this little book, this little How Good Are You book. And I was nervous, but the guy listened well. We went through the whole thing. We had a great conversation. At the end, he, we were talking a lot about science. He had a lot of questions. But about halfway through, as I was sharing the gospel, I was just getting ready to get to his response and what he needs to do, the Russian mafia guy comes back up and goes, you're not going to believe this, but the Russian mafia is here. I told you this. There's one more thing I got to tell you about this. And he starts going, I'm like, get behind me, Satan. What in the world? Like, I can't even get this. So we finally got that guy away, but I finished this conversation with the guy and I was able to share the gospel with a librarian. Yes, it was victory. Although the guys there said, no, it doesn't count. It needs to be an older lady with the glasses and the bun. <laughs> But listen, I am counting it as a librarian. I'm just telling you that right now. Um, I, I don't always have courage. I, I can experience a lot of fear during these things. But Jesus had courage, and Jesus loved people enough to speak. He loved people enough to risk what they thought of him. And he was willing to say things that might be uncomfortable. And God can give us courage to love people in the same way. Number six, Jesus gets to the gospel. Did you notice how Jesus progressed in his conversation with the woman? He moved from the natural to the spiritual to the gospel. And that's a very good model for us to follow as we're engaging with folks. Jesus started this conversation by talking about natural things first, water. And that's something that we could do, just talk to people about natural things. 
about whatever, about the weather or the cowboys or your job or your kids, just things that are natural. For some of us, it can be hard to initiate conversations, especially with strangers, but people are usually very happy to reciprocate friendliness. We just need to take the first step, open our mouths and say something natural. Talking to people shows that we care. It shows that we're actually interested in them. And one of the best ways to do this, i found, is to ask people questions and then listen to them. I'm not very good at that. I'm not good at asking questions or listening. But, but did you notice how Jesus did that? He started out by asking a question. So, so Jesus was very natural at first. He was just talking about water. And then did you notice how he shifted from the natural to the spiritual? He moved from physical water to spiritual water, to the living water. Uh, when we were out to, we went out to lunch yesterday. What was it called? Hop Dotty? It's not Hop Daddy. Hop Dottie. Okay, so we went to this restaurant, and there's a real nice guy there. Um, he was he was he had a shirt. He's called the Burger Bouncer, which I've never heard of. We don't have any Burger Bouncers. I was like, what is this guy bouncing? Who's people trying to cut in line or something? I didn't understand it. But anyway, we got into this great conversation with this guy. Um, we just were talking about natural things. I'm talking to him about his job, and he was real friendly. And we got into this conversation with him, and he just kept coming back to our table because we were outside. He was right there, and so we just started out with natural things and. And then at some point I tried to jump over, and this is where it can get uncomfortable, to the spiritual. And I say, hey, did, you know, do you go to church at all? Or did you grow up in a church? And he was like, no, no, we didn't grow up in church. And, 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 and he kind of shut the conversation down. It was clear his parents never went to church. He didn't go to church. He didn't, didn't seem comfortable with church. So I thought, okay, well, that's why I tried to jump from natural was better. Spiritual was a little more tough there. It seems like we hit a wall. And so, but he kept talking to us the whole time. And... Um, and at the end of the conversation, I was able to transition it to the gospel. Now, before I talk about that, um, once you talk about the spiritual, you can, you can do it in many ways. You can talk about how God has helped you in a difficult situation or an event that you're doing with your small group. That's spiritual. Or you can mention the beauty of creation. One of my favorite ways to talk about spiritual things is just to ask somebody if they go to church or if they grew up in church. That immediately makes it a spiritual conversation. And then Jesus went from the spiritual to the gospel. He told this woman he could give her eternal life. In that conversation with that waiter, his name was Jacob, I actually went up to him and I, I, I just felt a sense of boldness, wanted to try to connect with him. I said, hey, have you ever seen this little booklet, How Good Are You? It's, it's, uh, it talks about on a scale of one to 10, you know, how good do you think you are? How good, what would you say, Jacob, if one's really evil and 10's really good? And so he goes, I don't know, I'd give myself a nine. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. And he started talking about why he's better than a lot of his customers that come in and people that give him problems. And it's like, okay, great. Um, so I took him to the law and tried to help him to see his sin, as J.C. Ryle was saying. And, and I actually got a chance. I was surprised. I usually don't do this. He'd stand at the door. He seemed engaged. And he was much more open than I had anticipated and was able to, to share the gospel with him. Now, I know that that is very intimidating. I know that that can be scary. And I know it's a lot easier to keep to ourselves. But God can help, to help us to take small steps of boldness by opening our mouths for Christ. Number seven, Jesus exhausts himself to reach this woman. Now look at verse 31. We haven't read these verses here, but I want you to see this. He exhausts himself to reach this woman. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat. So his disciples had come back with the food. And his disciples said, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now listen, Jesus was tired. He was constantly ministering to people, caring, preaching the gospel, healing, delivering people from demons, instructing his disciples, debating the Pharisees. He had just finished up a late night conversation with Nicodemus. He rose early to commune with God, and he probably walked over 20 miles to get here. Verse 6 says he was wearied from the journey, and he crashed down with his back to the well while the disciples went into town to find food. Imagine this. I want you to picture this with me. Jesus sitting in the dust, leaning against the well in the hot sun, his feet aching when a woman approaches. 
when this Samaritan woman approaches. And Hebrews 4 says that Jesus was tempted in every way just as we are. I'll tell you how I would have been tempted if I was Jesus. I would not be thinking about reaching out to a woman and trying to start a friendly conversation, then transitioning to a spiritual conversation, then transitioning to the gospel. No, I'd be thinking about me. How can I get water, food, and rest immediately? But thank God Jesus doesn't give in to these temptations. What love he has for the lost. What an incredible display of compassion and care. He's so filled with love. He has to speak. I picture him just exhausted with his head against this well as he hears this woman approaching. And he's so committed to reaching the lost, he has to say something. And so he asks for a drink and gets it all started. When Jesus confronts her sin, she backpedals and begins to offer these excuses. Then he reveals that he is the Christ. She goes into town, tells everyone about this, and then the entire town comes out to see Jesus. Jesus is dog-tired. His disciples are urging him to eat. They, they're probably afraid he's going to pass out. Then this woman brings the whole village to him, which means he's going to be up very late caring for as many as he can. But he does not care about eating because he has food that his disciples don't know about. And he's not talking about physical food. He's saying there's something else that sustains him and gives him energy. There's something more important than food and drink and rest. It's reaching lost men and women with the gospel. His food is to do the mission, to do the will of the one who sent him. You know, in the book of John, Jesus often refers to himself as the one sent by God, as the sent one. We see that in verse 34. Jesus was sent to this broken, fallen world with a mission. He was sent to die. In this story, Jesus was thirsty. There's only one other time in the Bible when Jesus is thirsty. Do you know where that is? It's in John 19 when he's hanging on the cross. And Jesus says, I thirst. Jesus was willing to go thirsty so that others could drink living water. Jesus was willing to exhaust his life so that men and women would be saved from death. Jesus gave everything to rescue us. And now he's sending us. Did you know that Jesus is not the only sent one? We have been sent as well. When we become followers of Christ, we're called to certain things like fellowship and prayer, listening to preaching and giving and reading God's word. Those are wonderful things, but there is more. We are also sent out into the world to help others become followers of Christ. Did you know that? Did you know you are a sent one as well? And and when we reach out to people, listen to this, when we reach out to people, there is a spiritual nourishment that we receive. There's a strengthening that we receive. Do you feel right now spiritually weak? Do you feel spiritually undernourished? Try reaching out to someone. Try building a friendship with a non-Christian. Try sharing the gospel. And watch how God feeds your soul. I love this picture of Jesus leaning against the well, talking to the sinful Samaritan woman, and then struggling to his feet as the entire village surrounds him. I love how he overcame his weariness and how he tired himself out to reach the lost. God wants us to tire ourselves out to reach the lost. Number eight, my last point. Number eight, Jesus urgently reached out. He urgently reached out. Look at verse 35. Jesus said, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. My mother-in-law grew up on a small farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Does anybody know? This is where the Amish, this is where the Amish live. She grew up in a tiny little town called Five Pointville. 
and her dad had a very small farm and these small farms they didn't have their own equipment their harvesters and these things and so they would hire harvesters who would come in and my mother-in-law tells a story when she was really little uh, her and her sister they remember when the harvest was such a an important time and she remembers her mom would cook this big special breakfast and then she said these strange men the harvesters would be there early in the morning eating breakfast with their family and they would work so hard because when there's a harvest, you, you, you have no time to waste. There's a window for that harvest. If you miss that window, the crop is ruined. And so you have to get it done. She says even now in Lancaster, she can hear uh, during harvest time, like at th three in the morning, four in the morning, she'll hear the harvesters go by. But, but when she was little, she remembers these men working so hard and her mom made this homemade lemonade, which she never made, and her and her sister would run across the stubbly field and lift it up to these men who were covered in sweat and dirt and corn and all the things that they were harvesting. And then they would eat lunch with them. They'd eat dinner and work hard into the night. That's what the, the harvest is like. A, a harvest can't wait. You, you have to harvest it now. When the field is ripe, you, you have to hustle. And Jesus is saying to us, the harvest is ripe. It's ripe. It's ready. The time to harvest is right now. And Jesus challenges his disciples when he says, don't you say four months and then the harvest? Because that was the saying, which meant hey, don't rush. Hey, we have time. We, we can wait. When you've sown and planted something, you, you have to sit around and wait for months for it. But Jesus is saying, well, listen, we don't have to wait. It's time to reap right now. He's exhorting his disciples, saying, don't, don't say we can do this later. Don't say you're going to get to this in a couple months. Don't say I don't have time or, or I don't have the gifting or someone else can do this or I just have to get this area of my life straightened out first or, or I'm too much of a hypocrite or I don't know what to say or I'm too scared or I'll just wait until they come to me. No. We don't have to wait. Lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now that white harvest was probably the Samaritans who were coming toward him in white robes. The Samaritans wore white robes. They said to his disciples, lift up your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. Let me ask you a question. Do you see the ripe harvest all around you? Do you see it? Your neighbors and your co-workers, family members and waitresses, and people at the gym and at the bank, at Starbucks, your mechanic, your hairdresser, your mailman, your classmates, they need Jesus. They need him. And they need you to reach out. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and see the harvest. There, there is an urgency that we should feel when it comes to reaching the lost. Let me close with verse 36. Look at it. It says this. Jesus says, Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Well, what is he saying there? He's saying, guys, guys, we're already reaping. I, I just sowed by reaching out to this woman, and I'm already reaping and collecting wages. The fruit is coming in right now. We, we don't have to wait. We can sow and reap at the same time. Usually the one that sows has to wait for a long time after he's planted. You don't put a tomato seed in the ground in the morning and by evening you're picking ripe tomatoes. He's saying that, but this is what's happening. We're sowing and reaping simultaneously. You can do it in the same day. The sower and the reaper are rejoicing together. Jesus found great joy in the middle of the harvest field. Sweaty, dirty, and tired. And we can find great joy as we join God in his glorious plan to save the lost. There is nothing in this world that will bring you more joy than seeing someone come to know the forgiveness of their sins through Christ. 
Harvesting can be hard work. It can be long hours and discouragements and rejections and setbacks. But there is a joy to come. And Jesus is sending us into the harvest for our joy. We close with this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He said, if you are eager for real joy, such as you may think over and sleep upon, I am persuaded that no joy of growing wealthy, no joy of increasing knowledge, no joy of influence over your fellow creatures, no joy of any other sort can ever be compared with the rapture of saving a soul from death and helping to restore our lost brethren to our great Father's house. Amen. I'd like to take a, a moment right now. Um, Aaron and I, Bart, before he left for the pastor's college, and Mark, um, have, have really been anticipating this year. And this is one of the messages we were anticipating, as well as, as I said earlier, the number of moments we've had this year to talk about this topic. Um, I, I heard Jim say a couple of times over the weekend that evangelism is, is just the most difficult area to obey. And it is, it is difficult to obey. But the Word of God draws us, it compels us, it inspires us, it has the power to change us. I'd like us to pray right now for opportunities and boldness. We, we don't want this year to pass as a checklist on our church diet that we covered the area of evangelism extensively that year, and thankfully we can, we can move on to other topics. We, we want it to be a foundation stone in our identity as a church. And for any of us that reaching out to the lost, building friendships with those that don't know the Lord is a rare and unusual moment, we, we want this year to change that, that we would be different in that regard. So let's pray for that right now. Let's just bow our heads and seek the Lord that he would give us real opportunities and boldness to take action this week the way our Lord did toward that Samaritan woman. Let's pray. Pray with me right now. Lord, we, we come to you as those that are weak and vulnerable and needy. Lord, we don't have confidence in our own ability, but our own skill, our own personalities, Lord, we, we have confidence, though, in you. Lord, we are united to you. We are united to the great soul seeker. You dwell in us by your spirit. The same one who reached out to that woman dwells in us by your spirit. And Lord, we pray, Lord, you would move through us this week towards those that don't know you. Lord, give us a moment today, tomorrow, this week that we can begin or continue a conversation. Lord, give us courage to transition from natural things to spiritual things and from spiritual things to the gospel. Lord, I pray right now you would lay on every heart names and faces. Lord, the neighbor that we've never met yet or that we haven't talked to in months, and I, I pray, Lord, you would lay on our hearts right now some way of initiating towards them this week. Some way, Lord. If it's a, a quick text or phone call about how we can serve them or inviting them over, if it's a moment of walking across the yard, Lord, if it's a longer conversation with a waiter or waitress, Lord, if it's someone on the soccer team that we can spend a little longer talking to, making that transition to a spiritual topic, Lord. Give us grace to do that this week, Lord. Lift our eyes, Lord Jesus, and show us the fields white for harvest. Do that among us, Lord. Make us different. We present ourselves under your word for you to change us. And we thank you for your faithfulness to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.